This is the fifth chapter of Romans. I have the privilege of doing an exposition of this amazing, the first 11 verses of this amazing chapter. Carl, uh, Carl Barth uh, loved this chapter. He called it the most important chapter about the gospel in the New Testament because it summarizes and brings everything together. And he had another word for it. He called it, it's about the Holy Spirit because this is a, a Paul's a Holy Spirit theology. And he says that this is the eternal yes chapter in the Bible, the eternal yes. So now we have a chance to read that together. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The, the chapter begins this way. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access. That's the new RSV, access. But I want to do a word study for you on that. It is literally the word, it's from ago in Greek, and pros ago means to, toward, uh, to be led toward. It's, it's a book about, it, it's a word about being led by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God. So watch how this un makes that, text so much clearer access really being led to the place is literally the word in Greek so we are being led to the place of this grace in which we stand that's how it begins and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God and not only that but we also rejoice in our suffering and now watch as he continues this idea of the Holy Spirit guiding us. He guides us first to discover the grace, all right? Now watch him guide us through trials, through trials in our lives. So, access to this grace, or he leads us toward the place of grace, and then we rejoice in sharing his glory, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Now, if, if you've been with me in studies, you know that St. Paul loves that word. It's the word upomeno, to hang in there, to stay in there. It is the word for steadfast. It's the word for endurance. And now that's the word he now uses. The Holy Spirit leads us through suffering through in, and gives us endurance. And endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he that has been given to us. One definition of the Holy Spirit that I like is from John Calvin. The whole of it comes to this. The Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ binds us to himself. The Holy Spirit is now flooding us with his love. And that love of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit who assures us of his, of the love of Christ. And now watch the text unfold. For while we were still weak or without strength, at the right time, this is very touching in light of last week when we looked at chapter four, we saw both Ishmael almost dying of thirst and, and young Isaac almost being sacrificed in a terrible Molech tradition of, of, the, of the rituals of the religions of the Babylonian time, Abraham was there and interrupted in both cases, intervened at the right time, God rescued Ishmael and water came to him in the desert and also Ab Abraham's son Isaac in, a, in the right time, interruption of that as sacrifice because God will do his own sacrificing. He doesn't need us to do it. So notice at the right time, for while we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, one other word study. The word God is not used in that word. I don't know why the RSV says ungodly. It's actually the word ah, that means not, but it's not worship. 
It's the word for worship, not God. So the right translation should really be God's love for us uh, because Christ died for the non-religious. It means unreligious, not religious. Ah, sable, not religious. It doesn't say not God. That would be ah, theus. That would be the word atheist. No, it's ah, sabu, not worshiper. So that's the word. It's unfortunately for us translated ungodly, but it should be translated non-worshipper. All right, read that again then. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died in behalf of the non-religious. Indeed, rarely will someone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, and that's one of the love words in the New Testament, a kind person. Someone might die for a kind person, uh, it might dare to die. But God, and one last word study, he now uses the word for stand and puts a with in front of it. God stands with us. Stands with us. Uh, so that we can experience uh, his love. And, and that is very interesting in Holy Spirit sense because our Lord, when he described the Holy Spirit in the book of John, he talks about the Holy Spirit as the one who comes alongside, the parakaliotetos, the one who comes alongside of us. So Paul is now giving that same theology here. He said, so perhaps for a good, good person, someone might dare to die, but God stands with us in his love so that while we were still sinners, Christ died in our behalf, died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been forgiven, justified by his blood, his life given in our behalf, we will be then saved, made safe, made safe from the judgment of God. For if while we were enemies, now he even strengthens it and says, not only we're not religious, but even if when we were enemies, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled, and here's my last word study, reconciled is a very sophisticated word. In Greek, it is in English too. It is the word katalizo. And katalizo is, is used in modern chemistry to refer to a chemical agent that is brought into a, an experiment of other, of other chemical agents. And it changes everything it's around, but it doesn't change itself. It stays what it is, but it changes everything it touches. And that's considered a catalytic agent. And that's the word for reconcile. God change, changes us, but he stays who he is. His love, his sacrifice was his. And it, the effect was it changes our lives. So now with that in mind, listen to this amazing use of the word reconcile that Paul now uses three times in this text. So uh, we were, if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more surely now, having been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life, his resurrection. His life now seals it. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Okay, there is a great text from St. Paul. It's Bart calls it the eternal yes text. Now, let me read it one more time to you. It starts out with the, the, the Holy Spirit pouring out his love, first leading us through times of trial and then pouring out the love of God in our, into our lives. So because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. And now watch it unfold. For while we were still without strength, at the right time Christ died, in behalf of the non-religious, the non-religious person. Now, indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God stands alongside of us, proves his love for us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been forgiven, justified by his, literally his blood, by his life given in our behalf. 
we will now be saved, made safe from the judgment of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled, that means God changed us. He stayed who he was, but he changed our lives. God changed us, reconciled us. Uh, therefore, uh, more than that, we boast in, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've received this reconciliation. This is the text. It's an amazing text. It's a text about the Holy Spirit assuring us with the eternal yes and assuring us of God's love in our lives and how God is the one who uh, sets us free and is the one who forgives our sins. Can I give you a little history? Uh, 25 years ago, in this very pulpit, I preached a sermon here. On, I was in the middle of a series on the Holy Spirit. And on that particular Sunday, that was, that was May 29th, 1994. Today, we're in May 26th, 19, uh, 2019. But 25 years ago, I preached a sermon then on uh, the Holy Spirit because I was in the series on the Holy Spirit. And the, the Sunday, last exact Sunday is today, I preached on the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one who assures us of our forgiveness assures us of our belovedness. I used a different text. I didn't use this Romans 5 text. I used a text from 1 John, a text that you all know because we use it a lot in worship when we have the confession of sins and then we thank God for the forgiveness of our sins. But the 1 John passage begins this way. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, see the same theology as Paul, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. Now he uses that word as a kind of a word for reconcile. He cleanses us, in other words, he, he makes us whole from all sin. Now, but there's a problem in that text because then Paul, not Paul, John goes on to say, but if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. He says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You often quote that here after a prayer of confession. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, and I had a problem in that text because here I'm preaching on this is 25 years ago, I'm preaching on the assurance of the Holy Spirit. But then I point out that some people don't think they need that assurance. That's a problem if we say we have no sin. Some people say, I don't need forgiveness. I don't need to be forgiven. Uh, I don't need, I'm, you say I'm weak. I don't think I'm weak. I'm, I'm basically strong. And I, I don't think I need to have, uh, I don't need forgiveness. I need just uh, maybe a little coach here and there, but I'm doing fine, thank you. And so then how does this the Holy Spirit help us then if we're, in, in John says, we're deceiving ourselves. By the way, it was Nietzsche who said that he hated the doctrine of forgiveness of the Christians because it was a beggar's doctrine. I don't want a beggar's doctrine. Nietzsche wanted a power doctrine for himself. It was the theology of power. And so he, I don't want that. I, I don't need forgiveness. I just need to do what I'm doing because I'm so smart and so strong. And so I had to figure out 25 years ago, how could I create maybe an illustration or something that would lure you into uh, challenging the deception and without offending you so that I didn't people walking out on me. So I'm trying to think of what illustration can I give of that? And so I thought up one. And that is, uh, uh, you know, I love to take the ferry from Uncle Teal and go over to Whidbey Island. And very often, in a windy day, if you go to that ferry dock, you'll see a park next to it. And there are countless families out there flying kites. 
because kites are really great and that's a tremendous sport for a family. And especially when the wind is up and, uh, and you're on a beach where there's water and you can have a lot of fun. And I can remember seeing those kite flyers. I, when I was at Berkeley, the Berkeley Pier was the same way. And the, what they call the estuary, when huge kites would be flying all along Interstate 80 by the San Francisco Bay where it was windy. And so I said, I'm going to create a parable. And so I said, you know what a kite is? A kite is that little piece of, uh, of paper, two sticks, and then a family gets it, uh, ties it, a string to it, and they run down the beach a little bit, and then the kite goes up in the air. And I said, imagine a kite that could think for itself. And if you were a thinking kite, and you were up in mid-flight, and you're up there way above Mickle Muckle Teal, and you say, man, alive, I've got so much power in me. Wow, I could really go. And I could go over to Olympics, the mountains, they're right there. And I could go to Whidbey Island. Wow, what a thing I can do. Except for one thing. I've got a string tied to me that is holding me to a bunch of kids on the ground that are they're keeping me from going higher. And I just, I know what I'll do. I, I've, I've, got, an, I've got an answer. The next time we go up, I'm going to sneak a pair of scissors. Remember, this is a thinking kite. I'm going to sneak a pair of scissors on board. And when I get up to the mid-flight again and get up to where there's a little height, I am going to show them. They'll be really embarrassed. I'm going to pull my little scissors and snip that string. And then, watch me. I will really go. So I, I, I told that parable. And I said, but you know, everybody that ever flew a kite, you all laughed about this because you know that when the string breaks on a kite, the kite unceremoniously falls to the ground. It is not exactly a good moment. And so uh, everybody that's ever flown a kite knows that. Uh, the kite didn't know it. The kite hadn't taken physics and didn't know that the, the string is what enables the kite to fly. They, he doesn't know it. He, but he feels the strength and feels the tug and it makes sense, doesn't it? That it's tensioning me. It's a tug and it holds me back if I only could get free of it. So that's what I parable I told. And then I, told, then I said at the end of the sermon, the sermon was over and I said, now uh, thank God for the fact that uh, if we don't fall for that deception, then we can have experience of having our sins forgiven. Okay, and that was the end of my sermon. The next day we had staff meeting. I was senior pastor then. So I would meet with the staff always on Monday. That was my tradition here. And we were having a staff meeting, and a, a, a layman in our church named Bruce Barton Bailey, by the way, he died this week, but Bruce Bailey was very active in this church. And he was uh, the assistant, a, a lay helper to Denny Ryberg. And in the inn, he would often do readings in, uh, in the inn. And so he was a marvelous, marvelous guy. And, but he was a little bit impudent too, because he, he was not, uh, he was just a layman. He was not on the staff, you know. And we were in there having a staff meeting and Bruce kind of came in on the meeting and said, Earl, can I interrupt you for just a minute? And I said, yeah, okay. He says, here, uh, yesterday in your sermon, during the sermon, I wrote a poem while you were preaching. I hope you don't be, uh, aren't offended by that. And I said, no, 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 that's fine, Bruce. Who could be offended at Bruce? Uh, a lot of people could, you know, but I, I didn't. <laughs> I mean, he's interrupting the staff meeting and he said, here, uh, and he put it on, it was a card about this big. He said, here, here's a little poem I wrote yesterday while you were preaching this very sermon. And I said, hey, thanks, Bruce. And then uh, he handed it to me. So I thought in, in fairness to Bruce and to everybody there, I should probably, uh, do you want me to read it? Or do you want to read it, Bruce? He said, no, no, you go ahead and read it. And so I said, okay, so I read it to the staff. Here's the poem. It's called, I am the kite. I am the kite, red and orange, fire in the sky, stunt kike, cutting loops and gashes in the blue, skin vibrating on frame bent with power. I cut the cord to fly yet higher still, to show the rest what freedom's all about. I turn and twist my fanciest curl and set a course for distance. But my mistake was not to take the wind for granted, but the cord that tensioned me to one I did not see so far below. The flyer is not me. 
And then he ended that with a prayer. Lord, give me anchor. Give me pause. Let me know in freedom's limited flight the kite's first cause. Well, I was blown away, as was the whole staff. We, we, we sat there. We, we really, uh, we were just overwhelmed. I said, hey, Bruce, can I read that to the congregation next Sunday? He said, yes, go ahead. So I did. I read it to the congregation. And this congregation, that's 25 years ago, you were, you were overwhelmed. As a matter of fact, I read it for several Sundays in a row because everybody wanted to hear that poem. I got Bruce to actually produce a copy of it, which he did. Many of you have this in your house, maybe framed. I am the kite. It's at the bottom, it says, Bruce Barton Bailey, University Presbyterian Church, Sunday, May 29th, 1994, 25 years ago. And, you know... It, it, it was just greatly appreciated by everybody. Everybody w w loved that poem. And I got some other poems, too, that were sent to me by people. I got, I got a lot. When I was senior pastor, I got a lot of poems from anonymous poets. And I had one anonymous poet who regularly sent poems to me, and I never knew his name, except it was a man, because he, the way he printed, I felt that's not the way a woman writes. It was a man's printing. <laughs> And, and one day he referred to his father in a poem, so I figured that's a son of a father. And, and so I, he sent me a lot of poems. And so about six weeks after this poem that I read, I Am the Kite, and then, of course, read several times afterward, uh, I got a letter from him. And again, he, never, he didn't identify himself. By the way, in the narthex, after the set first service, we were photoed together because I, he later introduced himself to me. And uh, he said... I wrote a poem that I'm sending. He sent it anonymously. And he said, uh, at the beginning, of the, uh, the poem was meant to be a spoof on the kite poem. But, and this is exactly what he wrote. But halfway through my poem, something happened to me. I'll read that poem now. It's called, I Am the Balloon. I am the balloon. Blue and green, flying in the sky, stunt balloon. I laugh at the kite below, cutting loops and gashes in the blue. I grow weary of hearing his poem. <laughs> this is a spoof on that poem. His power is not his own. I have no cord to cut. My power comes from within. Talk about convergence. I soar miles above Mount Shasta, and that was a direct dig at me because I had made too many comments about Mount Shasta. I've climbed it, you know. I've climbed Shasta 50 times the summit. Uh, I, I don't make a lot of bragging statements about Mount Rainier because I tried three times but did not summit Rainier, so I stick to making comments about Shasta. And so and he's making fun of me now. I soar miles above Mount Shasta as the kite flutters helplessly to the trees below. I ascend into the stratosphere, growing large and more powerful as I rise. But whoa, what's this? I'm feeling tight. What was that sound? Oh my, I fear. I'm just a wad of latex on the ground. Here comes that kite flyer. I hope he doesn't step on me. His hands are warm. He is stretching me on a cross. I am a kite. Amen. That's the I am the balloon poem. You know... That is what St. Paul is getting at when he points out to us that we are in need of God's help. We need forgiveness. We need to have the string that ties us uh, to Jesus Christ. And that's the Holy Spirit is the whole of it comes to this. The Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ binds us to himself. But he binds us to himself not to uh, not to control us, but to set us free, 
to set us free to be what we were meant to be. And, and that is what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about. But that's what St. Paul is saying when he, in Romans 5, is talking about the eternal yes. He fulfills our life and makes us whole. We're grateful. Uh, we're grateful for these two poems that have both enriched our lives here at University Press. And by the way, I wrote a book in 2006 when I was senior pastor here, and it was called Trusting God. And in my book, I decided to enclose the whole story of those poems, which I did. And so I did, I'll tell you this a little bit. I said to my grandchildren, I have eight grandchildren, and I said, if any one of you grandchildren can fly a kite and get it photographed, I'll put it on the cover of my book. And one of them did. And it was Drew, uh, my, my, my oldest grandson. He did manage to do it. A couple of the others couldn't quite get the kite up to be photographed, but he got his up and he photographed it. And here it is, flying it in Whidbey Island. And uh, he's just a little kid then. And he's now a freshman, by the way, in physics at UC Berkeley, my school. <laughs> but he, uh, he flew the kite. So, you know, uh, we were meant to, we were meant to have an experience of fulfillment. And the Holy Spirit is the one who assures us of that fulfillment. And Jesus Christ is the one who loves us and makes it possible for us to have that life, that eternal life. Heavenly Father, thank you for this. Thank you for the history we have of uh, your faithfulness. We thank you for uh, people in our lives like Bruce Bailey and... Denny Ryberg, he worked with. Great uh, people who have ch challenged and blessed us in their ministries. And now, Lord, bless each of us as we seek to share your love and to be the kite we were meant to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen.